uh, policing and snakes. So we've got uh, the first speaker is Harry Rakowski, game warden in Hidalgo County, and he, he'll be talking about laws, ethics, and regulation of local resources. And then after the break, we'll have the herpetologist from Gladys Porter Zoo, Clint Guadiana, and he'll be speaking to us. So I know Harry's online. And, and I did send everyone Harry's uh, bio. And he's been uh, with Texas Parks and Wildlife since 2010. And uh, he's had a lot of good adventures since being a uh, game warden, and he's going to tell you about some of those along with the information about the laws and ethics. So, if you want to go ahead and share. Okay. Yes, please go ahead and share your screen. Okay. All right. Can everybody hear me okay? Perfect. Yeah. <sighs> See if I can figure this thing out. Yeah, we can see it. Okay. All right. So, so as Barbara mentioned, thank you, Barbara. By the way, um, as Barbara mentioned, my name is Harry Rakoski, and I was I was hoping to be there uh, tonight. Actually, good evening to everybody. We have a special treat for you tonight with Clint. I get a chance to uh, work with Clint on and off whenever I've got some unusual reptiles. So it's it's always good to have a an expert uh, close by that uh, I can call on. There's always all sorts of things that, that people have that they don't necessarily should have. So, uh, so it's good to have them. Um, tonight, I'm gonna speak about laws and regulation and ethics. Uh, as I'm a, I'm a Texas game warden. I've been with Parks and Wildlife for uh, since 2010, so I guess that's about 12, 13 years that I'm going on. I'm also a state peace officer. Texas game wardens are, are kind of dual roles, state peace officer. Also, we protect resources. Some of my uh, primary duties are going to be education and crime deterrence. And we kind of do these in these orders, uh, in, in this order, education first, and then crime deterrence. We primarily do that through uh, patrols and checking on people. And then kind of the last thing is law enforcement, as far as hooking people up. We just assume them not get in trouble before we ever get to the point where we have to issue them a ticket or whatever. So so we like to, uh, to work with people on um, just getting things right. Our primary focus is wildlife and natural resources and the environment. And a big part of what we do is also water safety. So we don't have that so much here where I am in Hidalgo County. Uh, we have the river um, that we'll go down on, but uh, there's, not, there's not a whole lot of traffic as far as boats on the river other than a lot of law enforcement boats. Um, but on weekends, especially, uh, there'll be some, some boats out there doing fishing or whatever. Um, where we have more of the traffic is over in Cameron County, which is part of my district. And I'll go over there once a year and jump on shrimp boats for a week. Um, every once in a while, we'll have operations. A couple of weeks ago, I was out there. Uh, the, the water in the Gulf was, uh, too high, so we didn't spend much time in the Gulf. Uh, so we spent more time on the river by Boca Chica, picking up gill nets um, from illegal fishing and that kind of thing. Our mission, uh, as far as parks and wildlife, is to balance the use or enjoyment with the conservation or protection of our natural resources. And so we protect Texas wildlife and their natural habitats as far as kind of definitions what are wildlife well it's basically any animals that live in the wild and are not domesticated and then their natural habitats are where are the places that those wild animals normally live and grow our department today we have about 3500 employees throughout the state and there's 11 divisions with law enforcement being one of those divisions 
We have over 90 state parks. And just to, to let you know some of our funding sources that we have, our hunting and fishing license is, is a big part of it. Sales tax on sporting goods, boat registration fees, and federal excise taxes on things like firearms and ammunition, and fishing tackle, and boat motor fuel. Um, those are all things that provide money to the department. I always enjoy working with and, and speaking with the Texas Master Naturalist. Um, I went through the program and it was just uh, very valuable to me. Um, one thing that, that when I think about Texas Master Naturalist, I think about them being as models of the community and for the community. And uh, so it's good to have a good base on what are what are the laws and the regulations and those kind of things. When I think of actions of TMN, I think of it as a three-legged stool with laws being one of those legs and rules and regulations. And then third is ethics is the third leg. So having a good grasp of those things and, and being knowledgeable and being able to uh, share your knowledge with others is, is a good thing. One of the cool things about Texas Master Naturalist is that they're naturally inspired and they're naturally inclined. Um, so you're naturally inspired to explore, which is a super cool thing to learn, to collect things like feathers and eggs and skulls and teeth and skins and shells. Uh, and also artifacts. So those are so those are some of the things that are going to be out there. You just got to be careful in knowing what it is that uh, it's okay to have and and what what you need to be careful with. And that includes also animals themselves and and things like that. Um, so there's no question that inquisitiveness and a desire to learn and collect are great qualities. However, part of our outdoor education involves learning what kinds of things are legally protected. So protected things include endangered and threatened species. Um, and some of the ones around here that uh, we run into, of course, are the ocelot um, over in Laguna Atascosa, especially. Um, there's probably some ranches that have them. Threatened species around here are things like um, the Texas tortoise is a real common one. Uh, I'll get lots of calls from people that want to let me know about somebody that's got a Texas tortoise. Uh, a lot of times I'll go pick them up and uh, if, it, if it's been with a kid, chances are pretty good. It's going to be painted with their school colors. So that's that's not such a good thing for a Texas tortoise, but uh, um, another good kind of cool thing about a Texas tortoise was I picked one up from somebody one time, and uh, I think I'm probably the only game warden in the state of Texas that has ever had a Texas tortoise lay eggs in their pickup truck. So so that was quite the experience. Uh, other protected things are most migratory birds and their parts including the feathers and eggs and nests and things like that. Exceptions, however, would be legally taken birds. So if you've got a hunting license and you go out and you um, shoot a turkey, uh, it would be okay to, to have that turkey feather and put it in your hat, that would be fine. The kind of things you wouldn't be able to do are like shoot that gray hawk that's flying by and then take its feather and put it in your hat. Also, marine mammals and their parts are protected. Um, dolphins being one of those that I can think of. And let's say that you came across a stranded, um, or not, not even stranded, but just a dead dolphin or a skull of a dolphin on the beach, then um, it, you would not be able to, to keep that. As a matter of fact, I confiscated one one time when we were doing a search warrant and the guy had a a dolphin skull with them. And then even plants are sometimes protected. 
Uh, I know, especially over in Star County, there's some cactus and um, things like that that uh, that you want to be careful with as far as what you're picking up. And then the the other big one that I would say that's protected is going to be the rights of property owners, whether it's public or private property. You want to make sure that you're only on those places that you have permission to be on and uh, and that you only take away with you anything that uh, that you have permi permission to, to be bringing with you. So what are laws? Um, basically, it's a, a system of rules to govern our behavior. And so Texas has a complex set of laws, a handful of which are the Parks and Wildlife Code, which is the main one that we go by as far as enforcing uh, our duties and our laws. There's also the Penal Code, so when you think about things like burglary and mm, theft and things like that, that would be Penal Code issues. There's also the Transportation Code, which uh, I always have found amazing. The Penal Code is is kind of thin, um, but you get to the transportation code and it's it's pretty thick. Um, so there's lots of things that you can get dinged on when you're out there on the road. Um, but we have to know the transportation code as well. There's also the health and safety code and the water code. So lots of codes, administrative code is, a lot of that is taking the, the bigger laws and rules and putting them into the more detailed Kind of issues. So all of these laws, they're derived from our state's constitution. And uh, how it works is proposed laws go through the legislative process, and then they're ultimately codified into these statutes. And so that's, I reckon that's why they call them codes, is because they've been codified. Some examples of state laws, we've got Texas Penal Code, Chapter 30 um, is going to be criminal trespass. I actually deal with that one a lot. Um, I'll get calls from people being on reservoirs, let's say irrigation reservoirs that they're not supposed to be, or landowners will call me and say, hey, I got some guys dove hunting on my property. Um, uh, irrigation canals, technically, uh, especially if they're posted. Um, that would be considered a criminal trespass issue. And so a lot of times I'll move people along that are uh, fishing there. Um, I'll check their fishing license first and their limits and all that kind of stuff. And then I'll say, oh, by the way, you can't be here. So criminal trespass prohibits individuals from entering property, including agricultural land, without the effective consent of the owner. So even though it's not... Um, Let's say it's not barbed wire, not fenced off. If you see that there's crops there, um, then that would be considered trespass if you uh, decided to go into that property. And so that's how, like with dove hunters, a lot of them will get out of their vehicles and go into people's fields, and they can't do that without permission. Another uh, example of a state law is Texas Parks and Wildlife Code, Chapter 64. Uh, this is talking about protected birds, and it protects non-game bird plumage and nests. Um, and some examples of that, I've gone and driven by uh, a residence and see cardinals in their bird cages. That would be an example of a protected bird. Um, and so uh, what I'll do is, uh, get the birds out of the, actually, I'll let the, the person get it out because a lot of times they'll bite you and that kind of stuff, and I just assume them get bit as me. And then uh, depending on the circumstances and their disposition, <clears throat> they're going to either get a warning for uh, that or a citation. The citations could go up to $500 if it's a Class C misdemeanor. Another example of a state law is Texas Health and Safety Code, Chapter 365, and this is referring to littering. Um, it explains our state's dumping laws, and it includes enhanced 
penalties for certain offenses. So the interesting thing about uh, dumping or littering is if it's less than five pounds, you know, somebody throws some trash out, you're going to get a ticket. It's going to be up to $500 plus I'll, I'll make you pick up your stuff. Uh, but let's say that it's uh, over five pounds, then right there it turns into a class B misdemeanor. And that's a, like go to jail, can be in there for 180 days kind of thing. Plus, I think it's a couple of thousand dollar fine that you can get for it. And so um, we consider that as, as part of uh, protecting our environment. So if, if I was to see people dumping, then, um, then I would take care of that. So an example would be, I see somebody that's got a tire that they didn't want to properly dispose of because they didn't want to pay that extra $5 disposal fee or whatever, and they dump it on a county road. And I just happen to be there watching for, or listening for poachers then, uh, and I see them stop and um, I check them out and see that they dump something that would be right there. One tire, they go to jail. All right, so what's the difference between laws and regulations? Um, laws are those things that our legislators uh, decide on. Um, they're representing us. There's 150 representatives and 31 senators, and they meet biennially, meaning every two years, unless they call a spe special session, then they'll be meeting and talking about what kind of laws they want to uh, implement or tweak or whatever. And then regulations, those are things as far as our department's concerned that's decided by uh, nine commissioners. And so they're actually appointed by the governor and they're on a rotation of like, I think it's every two years, uh, three of those commissioners roll out. I think the terms themselves might be six years. So it's like a third of them, uh, unless they're reappointed, are going to get replaced with somebody else. Uh, we talked about laws, regulations, are directives or rules that are made by government agencies to carry out the intent of the laws. So there might be this Parks and Wildlife Code, that's the law, and then our agency is kind of the steward of it and will implement it by creating regulations, which is what the commission does. So examples of regulations are when the start of a particular season is, like dove season. And actually that ties in also with federal laws because um, U.S. Fish and Wildlife uh, is primarily responsible for migratory um, birds and, and laws. And so we dovetail, no pun intended, with fish and wildlife to make sure that, uh, that we're on the same sheet of music. Um, another example of a regulation would be hunter's education requirements. And so once a, a hunter turns 17 years old, they must have had hunter's education, uh, with the exception of uh, if you're military or law enforcement, then you're exempt from that. Uh, and also there's, what's called a deferred um, hunter's ed. And so a person, let's say they forgot, they didn't get around to taking the course, which for an adult is online, it probably takes six hours or something. So there's not a whole lot of good reasons for doing it, but let's say uh, I'm not a hunter, but my buddy asked me to uh, come out and hunt with them and I didn't have it. I could just pay $10 at Academy and I'd have that deferral and uh, I wouldn't get a ticket. Um, but for the most part, people need to have hunter's education. Uh, if they're a kid and they don't have it, then they need to be within normal voice control of an adult that does have hunter's education. The price of a fishing license would be another thing that would be considered a, regula a regulated issue. Uh, annual bag limits, for instance, um, speckled sea trout uh, are going to have a limit of three down here in the lower part of the coast. Um, we, it was actually more until a couple of years ago, I think it was, when we had a big freeze. And so they, they limited uh, the amount as well as the size. 
And so they uh, created a, a smaller um, uh, range of how big the the sea trout could be. And so now it's 17 to 23 inches. If it's smaller, you got to throw it back in. If it's bigger, you got to throw it back in. And then another example, not so much down here, although there are some oysters, but uh, especially up around the, the northern parts of the coast, there's oysters. And so there's limits on uh, how much they can be harvesting. So these are all things that are contained within that Texas administrative code that I mentioned where it's kind of put in, uh, into the details of how the bigger regulations are uh, written. So a little bit about early history, kind of how game wardens and the department and all that kind of stuff came into play. Um, those are, oops, those are, by the way, uh, like hoop nets that uh, people used for fishing. They're illegal. If, if we see them in the river, we'll pull them out. And I haven't seen any that big, um, but there are uh, smaller ones that I've seen and we'll pull them as we will gill nets. So Texas has a, a strong history of wildlife management and conservation laws and activities. In 1861, way back, we actually enacted our first game law. And this said that we were gonna close the season for Northern Bob White quail on Galveston Island. So first Texas law having to do with game. And then in 1874, we enacted our first trespass statute. So, uh, you know, I mentioned that as one of our things in the penal code. So right from the get go with the state of Texas, we were real big on protecting our land and, uh, and not having people encroaching into our land. So uh, this protected enclosed lands from shooting, hunting, fishing, or fouling. 1879, we enacted our first general game laws, which protected songbirds and establishing a season for hunting dove and quail. Uh, looks to me like that's probably a turkey vulture, but uh, that would be an example of a protected bird that uh, we're not allowed to be shooting those anymore. In 1883, there were about 130 out of 200 at the time counties that decided that they were going to be exempt from all game laws. So they saw the state come in and came up with these game laws about what they could shoot or not shoot. And they said, you know what, we don't want to play that game. So we're just going to exempt ourselves." And so the county commissioners from all these different uh, counties decided they were, they were going to do their own thing. Not long after that, 1895, the Texas Fish and Oyster Commission was established. This is actually the precursor and where we recognize Texas Parks and Wildlife as a department as being established. Um, but back then it was focused on the coast and specifically on what were considered fish ladders and oysters and things like that. In 1900, um, there was an act, it's a federal act that came out called the Lacey Act. It was named after a senator. And this prohibits the interstate transfer of wildlife in violation of any law. So it's a very, very powerful law. And uh, a lot of times, especially if there's smuggling and things like that that are going on with the wildlife, then we'll get the federal agents involved in this and file Lacey Act violations. And these are kind of go to jail and thousands of dollars um, of, of impact on the person that's uh, got a Lacey Act violation going against them. So for instance, let's say that there's a tiger in Hidalgo County and it's against the law to have dangerous wild animals in the county of Hidalgo. Well, if somebody brings in a tiger, they then violated the law. And the fact that they, let's say that that tiger came from um, Exotic Joe, the Tiger King, uh, where he was, I think, Oklahoma. As a matter of fact, there was a tiger in Edinburgh that came in from Exotic Joe. And so that was an interstate violation and it, it was a Lacey Act violation that, uh, that 
person could be hit with. And so the, the tiger was seized and uh, the person was uh, given consequences for it. And uh, now the, the tiger, his name was originally Harry, the zoo named him Harry. And, uh, but when they transported him, they didn't know what his real name was. And so they changed his name to Ezra. And so now Ezra is li living happily ever after up in uh, north of Dallas and is just a, a very happy tiger. Um, 1903, uh, there was a five-year closed season on antelope and mountain sheep and deer that was established. It also set limits on how many turkey you could take, as well as quail and dove. And they also made uh, headlight hunting illegal at this time. So basically, people driving down the road and shining their lights off into the farm fields and seeing the, the deer and shooting them at night, that was made no longer illegal. And so kind of it kind of plays out even today. I'll sit out at night and watch for people that are spotlighting. Um, and uh, if I see vehicles, trucks moving slow down the road, then my immediate thought is going to be they're out there poaching for deer or, or road hunting. 1907, uh, the legislature created the Texas Game Fish and Oyster Commission. I think there might have been a little little deal where it seems like I remember that our department was shut down for a little bit and then resurrected. And this may have been when that happened, um, 1907, and they added game to our duties at that point. And game are basically regulated animals that, uh, especially when it comes to hunting and that kind of thing. Because what we found in our in past history is, um, if there's no limits on things, people kind of go crazy and just uh, shoot however many they could take, regardless of whether they're going to eat them or whatnot. In 1909, we had our first hunting licenses that were sold, and amazingly given that it was this far back that 5,000 of them were sold the first year. I wouldn't have thought that many. 1916, we mentioned the Lacey Act. This is the other real big federal law that uh, has to do with us, and that's the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And this is why you can't um, possess things like owls, which people will um, tend to do anyway or why you can't have hawks unless you're a falconer and you have a permit to be doing that. Um, but pretty much uh, anything that, that migrates through is gonna be considered under this law and they're protected. 1919, we had our first game wardens were hired uh, and we had a, a total of six of them and they patrolled the entire state. In 1925, um, land was allowed to be leased by the legislature to create some wildlife sanctuaries that uh, protected those animals from hunting. Back to game wardens, 1938. Prior to this time, we just wore our blue jeans and uh, cowboy hats and uh, had a gun and a, and a rule book, a law book, and that was it. Uh, but now we got our first uniform, so we started looking official at that time. By 1939, we had 93 game wardens that patrolled in their personal vehicles or on their own horses. Um, here's another example of some illegal netting. And here's some game wardens in the uniforms that we used to have, uh, checking for probably stopping some guy and seeing what kind of game he has in there. Conservation laws, 1946, we started our first Game Warden Academy. Uh, I think that was at Texas A&M actually, and it lasted for four months. It later moved to Austin in the city of Austin, and eventually it ended up in Hamilton, where it is today. And Hamilton's up by Lamb Passes. 1962, uh, Game Wardens got their first sedan, so we didn't have to use our own vehicles anymore. Uh, today we've got pickup trucks, by the way, which is kind of good, uh, especially when you're trying to get around some some crazy areas. 
1963, they changed our name uh, again uh, to what it is today, and that's Texas Parks and Wildlife Department. I would imagine because we incorporated parks into uh, the department and um, hence the name change. 1965, we got issued our own guns instead of having to have our own along with our Sam Brown belts. And then in 1971, not all that long ago, we became peace officers. So at that point, we could enforce any state laws. 1981, a bill came out that prohibited the commercial sale of redfish and trout. And that's where the conservation, Coastal Conservation Association, I think, started. They were real big on helping to implement that and protect our resources. And then Operation Game Thief, which is like a um, Crime Stoppers uh, program was started and you could contact uh, our Austin dispatcher. Um, it'll be the same telephone number for Operation Game Thief. And if you ever wanted to, you could Google it and, uh, and click in on um, if you wanted to report a violation. Okay, uh, as far as Texas is concerned, the biggest um, law that came into place would have been the Wildlife Conservation Act in 1983. And it gave Parks and Wildlife the authority to manage fish and wildlife resources in all of Texas counties. And so, as I mentioned before, the county commissioners said, no, we don't wanna play. Um, we'll just kind of do our own thing in our own county. And then finally the state came in and said, no, we're all gonna play by the same rules and Parks and Wildlife is gonna be the one that's enforcing it. So now the counties could no longer veto our department regulations. All right, so a question comes up, who owns Texas wildlife? Is it the, uh, is it the landowners whose property they're on? Is it the state of Texas that owns them? Who is it that owns the wildlife? And the answer is clear in Texas law. All wild animals, fur-bearing animals, wild birds, and wild fowl existing within the borders of this state are the property of the people of the state of Texas. So they're your critters that are out there. Um, I guess one issue becomes as to whether you can access those critters or not because um, a bunch of the land is going to be owned in Texas by private individuals. So in addition, state law extends to fish and aquatic life. That's why we can regulate fishing activities, the beds and bottoms of our waters. So it would be, for instance, illegal to go and get all the gravel out of a riverbed um, because it belongs to the state of Texas. All public freshwater shall remain open to the public. Um, importantly, and just to go back to that, um, public waters remain open to the public. I would say that sometimes public water is surrounded by private property. And so it's a question of how do you get to that public water um, without violating the trespass issues. So, as I mentioned, lots of stuff is owned by private landowners, and that number is like 94%. Uh, I've heard all the way up to 97% that is privately owned or operated, and that's three times more than any other state in our union. Property owners, by the way, can build fences to any height. That's why when you go down the road, let's say uh, 281 or 186, you'll see lots of high fence properties. That's because they can do it. At the same time, the wildlife traveling within Texas state boundaries is not owned by the landowner nor by the government, but as I mentioned, by the people of the state of Texas. However, landowners do play a key role in conservation of those animals that belong to us. So having good relationships with landowners is uh, a big part of what we do. Um, public lands, we don't have a whole lot of public lands that are owned by Texas here. Cameron County has more than Hidalgo County. I think you've got different wildlife management 
areas over there. In Hidalgo, it's primarily going to be around the Donna area um, that we have some public hunting. And to show you on a map how much of the land is owned privately, all that tan property is going to be private. And so the, that dark blue is federal land. Every once in a while, you'll see some green stuff like over in the Big Bend area. That's going to be state property. And then Laguna Atascosa, uh, National Seashore, uh, the Padre Island National Seashore, that's going to be owned by the federal government. Legal authority, um, there's basically jurisdictional authority. Um, you've got your city ordinances, your county orders, and then your state statutes and your federal laws. With wildlife freely crossing jurisdictional boundaries, wildlife don't care, um, but Texas Master Naturalists, uh, it's good to have knowledge uh, of where those federal laws um, can be highly relevant. As I mentioned, Lacey Act, it was 1900. That's Mr. Lacey there. He was a big conservationist. Um, it engaged in interstate or international trade involving wildlife, fish, or plants obtained in violation of any state or foreign law is going to be a ding that the federal government can step in on. It establishes criminal and civil penalties, and it's enforced by Fish and Wildlife, the Department of Agriculture, and U.S. Customs, like at the Port of Entries here along uh, our border with Mexico. And then the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. Here's a picture that kind of it kind of shows uh, why it is that we have that act in place. Um, people, especially back in the early 1900s, the late 1800s, people were getting these big long feathers from herons and um, just lots of lots of birds being killed just for hats and things like that, as well as just the market hunting that was going on and uh, just things were getting decimated. So they put that into place. And so we wanted to stop the extinctions from happening and created this law. It's actually a treaty between the U.S. and Canada, Japan, Mexico, and Russia are all signatories to it. And basically, it's unlawful to mess with any listed migratory bird. It's bird parts, the nest, the eggs, without a fish and wildlife permit. And so a lot of times I'll get calls for things like woodpeckers that have created a nest in the, the house and uh, or an owl that's gotten into somebody's um, barn or things like that. And then we'll have a chat with them about um, if there's a nest in place, uh, you basically just have to uh, wait it out. And then once the bird is excluded, um, when he's left the nest, the birds have fledged out the nets, that's the time to go in there and make sure that they can't get back in. Otherwise, you would actually need a permit to be able to take care of that. So as of 2021, I don't think it's changed any, there were almost 1,100 species that were listed under this act. Another big one is the Endangered Species Act. It came out in 1973, and it identifies those animals that are endangered or threatened throughout all or a big part of their range. Um, what is endangered, basically it means it's close to extinction. And we, so we want to uh, push back and save that species before they go away forever, like the dodo bird and the, I think the carrier pigeon and some other ones that have gone, gone the way of history. Uh, threatened uh, means that basically they're probably going to be endangered in the foreseeable future if we don't put some protections in place. So as of, uh, I think a couple of years ago, again, I don't think it's changed, but there were 2,224 plant and animal species that were listed, 608, 1,600, a uh, little bit over, were in the U.S. and are listed. And then Texas has its own protected list as well that are protected by the state. So for instance, even though um, the Texas tortoise is not listed on the federal list. It is listed on the Texas list, and so it's protected. 
All right, so those are laws and regulations. Uh, the last thing just to touch on is ethical standards. And uh, again, going back to that three-legged stool, we got our laws, we got our regulations, and we got our ethics. And so the implications for master naturalists are that you're going to come across situations where your knowledge of the laws and rules and even ethics is important. Um, we want to recognize that some of the questions that you get, especially if they're technical, it might be better to direct them to a local game warden. Um, but other than that, um, you know, feel free to educate others on what the laws are that are out there. Uh, it's probably not worth it to get into confrontations with people uh, over this kind of stuff, but, uh, you know, sometimes it's just a matter of somebody not knowing things. So, um, more importantly, though, your own actions are going to speak louder than your words. So, some scenarios to look at. This is a, an example of a gill net that uh, might be across the Rio Grande River. Uh, these are, there's different kinds of gill nets. They're, uh, some are like monofilaments, some are more crude, like almost like volleyball nets. But the basic idea is the fish are swimming into them, typically with the current or whatever, and then they get their gills caught in those um, spaces and then they can't back out because their gills are now stuck and they end up, uh, because they're not able to move, they don't get the oxygen they need and they end up dying. Thing about gill nets is they're indiscriminate. It doesn't matter whether it's a trash fish or an undersized snook or a big trout or a mullet, it's, it's gonna catch everything. They're totally illegal um, and if you've even got them in your car when you're close to a coastline, that in itself is illegal. So a gill net across a canal, if you saw one, uh, what would you want to do? Uh, another example would be a wild animal that you know somebody has that they shouldn't have. They've got a fox in a cage in their backyard, uh, a raccoon, uh, an owl that they're not supposed to have. Um, you got to think about how you would want to handle that. Again, com confrontations aren't good things. Usually things like gill nets and, and having animals illegally, they know what they're doing. And so it's best just to call uh, a game warden and let them know uh, what the details are. If you're questioned on wildlife rules, feel free to share with them what you know. If you're informed about trespassing or poaching or stealing of artifacts, um, get the information that you can, uh, you know, as far as just write it down, you know, or whatever, and uh, pass it on to us and we'll investigate it. You see that there's a screech owl for sale online. Uh, it'd be a good thing to take a screenshot of it um, because a lot of times that posting will go down pretty quickly because somebody will say, hey, that's illegal. And then they put it down before I have a chance to look at it. So. If you could take a screenshot, it usually has a telephone number and stuff on there, and then I'm able to track down who it is and go have a chat with that person. Let's say you find a feather on the ground. Um, may or may not be protected. I think there's like five or six species that are not protected, and you could pick them up like a, a house sparrow feather. That would be okay. A cardinal feather, eh, not okay. Hawk feather, eh, not okay. Um, do I, do I think I'd uh, uh, write a ticket on it? I don't know that I would. I'd probably just tell the person they can't have it and take the, the feather away from them. Uh, but if I saw a big collection of owl feathers or eagle feathers or one hanging from their, uh, one of these dream catchers and it's obvious that it's uh, protected feathers and I'm gonna take them away and, and give the person a ticket. Uh, feather collection on display somewhere Texas tortoise on a roadway. I don't know if you guys ever run across that. What I would say is don't get yourself killed trying to save a Texas tortoise. It is not worth it. Um, but if the traffic is clear, it's a, it's a deserted road, there's nobody around, and you wanted to get them off the roadway, then what I would say is whichever direction they were going, uh, keep them going in the same direction and put them on the other side of the road. Because uh, otherwise, you're going to put them on the wrong side of the road and they're just going 
uh, start all over with what they were going to do and uh, probably get squished. So, uh, let's say you see a badger skull across a fence. Um, uh, probably the bigger issue right here is that it's across the fence, and if you don't have permission to be across that fence, then you wouldn't want to be able to uh, to go and get it. So, and I'm just going to blow some through some permitting issues real quick. Uh, there's three main types. There's federal permits, and they got 63 permits. They got a ton of permits. Um, state permits, we don't have so many, uh, but we've got a good number too. And then local permits, cities and counties may have their own permits for things having to do with wildlife. As far as parks and wildlife permits, we've got 10 different types, including educational display permits. But typically, these go to educational institutions or government entities. It's not really something that just individuals can get. Uh, nonprofit educational organizations would be another one. Uh, they, even if they've got that permit, they can't sell them. They can't breed them. Um, they get two recommendation letters, and they, they have to report every few years uh, what the status is on the different thing. So, uh, one thing I'd say about Texas game wardens, going back to our duties, um, we've got robust inspection and authority. So basically the, the saying goes, wherever the mockingbird can fly, we can go. So if, if I think there's a violation going on, then, uh, then we're able to go and check it out. Um, another example might be going into, let's say somebody's bird hunting. <clears throat> uh, Typically, I'm going to open up their ice chest. I'm going to look in their vehicles, things like that. I'll try and be polite and and say, do you mind if I look in your ice chest? But at the same time, I'm opening the ice chest. I'm just being polite because uh, I have that authority to, to be able to check it out. Um, we can enforce any state laws anywhere in the state of Texas. So I mentioned illegal dumping is one thing, but... Uh, you blow by me on the highway doing 90 miles an hour in a 70 mile an hour zone, chances are pretty good. I'm probably going to pull you over and uh, you may get a ticket for that and it would be enforceable. We can also hold dual commissions as deputy federal agents. We have that with NOAA, which is the National Oceanographic um, Organization where uh, they enforce federal fishing laws and we can enforce those as well. Typically, we'll seize the items and defer or turn it over to NOAA at that point. Um, and again, as I mentioned, we, we focus on building relationships with the general public and with landowners. We're here to serve. So that's all I got. And so if there's any questions, hopefully I didn't lose y'all in the middle of all that. What do I do now? Harry, uh, there was one question online from Tom, and he w it was in reference to your comment about you can have a fence as high as possible, but obviously that would in impede the travel of wildlife. But that's okay for a landowner to do that anyway? Yes. Yeah, and it's, it's a, a uh, topic of discussion among uh, adjoining landowners, because sometimes there'll be a little landowner that'll be next to a bigger property, and they've got high fences because they're trying to manage the wildlife that's within their property. And uh, so it can create some not so good feelings sometimes, but basically, yeah, by state law, uh, landowners, even if you had a five acre property, a 10 foot fence up there, totally legal. Uh, officer, uh, this is Thomas as well. Um, on that same subject, what um, becomes a sticky situation, so to speak, is many of those high fence ranches are profiting off of the, the uh, game animals that are on those ranches, which as you right. stated, they're the property of the state of Texas, I'm not the state of Texas, but the public citizens of Texas, but yet uh, most of these um, uh, big ranches with game fences is how they make their money, is charging people to harvest those animals. Um, a lot of them even have rule, extended seasons and uh, extended limits. So I'm 
although I, I, you know, support the landowner's prerogative, I, I have a hard time putting my arms around that ability to to uh, use our property without any any say so from our part. Well, and the same thing could be said for other hunters that you know that I didn't want that hunter to be shooting my deer, um, that kind of thing. But um, the way that's reconciled is the fact that uh, one could argue that they're not uh, charging uh, to take the animal, they're charging for access to their property so they have the opportunity to hunt on that property. So, yeah, uh, I, I mean, I, I understand completely where you're coming from, but uh, basically it's the law is that they can do it and they can charge um, to allow people to come and hunt on their properties. It's a huge business. Yeah, I, I get that part. It's just the, the uh, what's, what's the word I want to use? The, their ability to, what's, what's the word I want to uh, benefit monetarily mm -hmm. and uh, take advantage of the situ situations using what has been stated to be our, the state of the citizens of the state of Texas property without any consent, without any, and not only without any consent, but because of the, the high fees involved, it limits the little guy from ever having the opportunity. And the more game fences go up like that, the less and less uh, uh, big mature animals uh, will be able to, to move around and, and people won't have access to them either. I understand where you're coming from, but yeah, but overall the law is that, that they're able to do it. And until the law gets changed, then that'll that'll continue to be the way it is i'd like the golden rule the uh, guy who has the gold rules <laughs> it could be could be okay hi sir this is jake i actually have two questions for you okay um, so first one, I work at the South Padre Island Birding Nature Center and Alligator Sanctuary, and as an educator there, I work primarily with the reptiles, and as an educator, you occasionally get those guys that feel obligated to let you know how cool they think they are and tell you all about the laws that they broke, usually in my case with regard to Texas tortoises or alligators. Um, being as that's customer interaction, it's kind of hard to ask them for their address or their phone number after that. What can we do as educators and master naturalists if we're put in those situations? Uh, and you've already let them know, you know, you really can't have that, or it's just they're bragging because they know that it's illegal. Every situation is different, but um, I'll have people either talking about how they've caught an alligator and telling me the story or how they're keeping a Texas tortoise or very rarely how they have a pet alligator that they acquired somehow. Yeah, you know, it, let's say that, that they told you specifically, I currently have a, an animal illegally. Eh, if it was me and I wanted to kind of be a detective or whatever, I'd just nonchalantly, uh, when they go back out to their car, I'd get their license plate and then I'd say, oh, by the way, game warden, this guy was bragging about how he's got a Texas tortoise at his house. And then I'd figure out where he is and I'd go knock on his door and Good deal. So you can go off the license plate numbers? I could. Mm -hmm. I'll be emailing you soon. Oh. <laughs> um, my second question, uh, question um, with regard to field herping, uh, do law, uh, headlight hunting laws apply to that for people who are road cruising just looking to photograph snakes? Um, herping, as far as collecting, you actually need a permit to go do that. Right. Just uh, photography, though? Yeah, I mean, the main thing is you want to be safe in what you're doing. Um, so you're going to probably going to attract attention. Um, oh, of course. Deputies or things like that. But, um, you know, it, I would think as long as you're doing it safely and you're not taking things, um, might not be a bad idea if you're doing that to have a like a high visibility vest. Um, just I'd just make it obvious that kind of what you're doing and not doing. Yes, sir. Thank you. Done.
And this is Joyce. My question is, how do we get in touch with the local game warden? Well, um, the best way is just Google it and say, find a warden, and then it will come up with a little link that uh, you can pick which county it is that you need. And, uh, and then there'll be a list of who the current game wardens are. Over in Cameron County, I think there's probably about eight of us. And here in Hidalgo County, we have three of us. Uh, and we work by counties, so it's usually best to contact the game warden where the violation is taking place. And what is the recommendation in terms of etiquette for master naturalists as to whether we call on the spot, we call from a safe distance? Um, yeah, again, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't recommend getting into a confrontation with anybody. So I just get the information and at your leisure, um, get it to us. If it was, uh, you know, if it was an obvious um, public safety at that moment, then getting a hold sooner than later is a good thing. So let's say a drunk boater that's driving, that would be a real good one to call us immediately. Um, some some of the like because people leave pretty quick. So if you see somebody with a gill net across a canal, that would be a good thing to let us know. And if if you can do it safely, um, getting the license plate is, is a good description. You know, I've got, there's a red pickup truck, you know, at a certain, near a certain inter intersection, that kind of thing. Harry, there was a question online regarding the changes to things such as the trout size and limits. Uh -huh. and, and I know that they, they have a certain length of time before they expire, but they're typically going to be reevaluated a month or two before they expire. Is that the normal process for some of those things? Um, I think that they said it and said, kind of, we'll relook at it in a couple of years or things like that. I don't, I don't think it's so much month by month, but at the point that it's getting ready to expire. Yeah. Then they'll, they'll probably have some kind of additional, um, hearing or whatever to, to see how things are going with it. And then basically what they do a lot of times is they go and take samples. Like I mentioned gill nets are illegal, but they're only illegal if somebody doesn't have permission to be doing it. So like researchers are gonna have permits to go gill net. And so I'll be out on the coast sometimes and there'll be research vessels or, or department vessels that are out there collecting fish because they're getting, they're surveying to see how many trout are out there uh, compared to what's out there historically. I think we had one question a couple of years ago, and this had to to happen to take place after our big cold freeze. And Parks and Wildlife implemented some restrictions on fishing because the fish were hit so bad. And the question from uh, TMNR was, how are we supposed to know that those regulations are in place and can we still get a ticket if we're out there? You know, ignorance, I assume, is not the right answer. Correct. Yeah, so when there's those freeze issues that come up, then Parks and Wildlife will put out press releases and get it on the local news and that kind of stuff. And in some of the hotter spots where people are known to really take advantage of the situation, we're going to put signs out usually saying, you know, it's prohibited until such and such a date and time. Um, this last freeze that happened, uh, the people, you know, for the most part, they know that they're out there doing things they're not supposed to. So if it's like right in the middle of the uh, the deal, then we're going to go out there and seize fish and, and give tickets. Um, this last time, it was like five minutes from, from when it was going to expire. So I just went and told them, you know, the, the freeze uh, regulations are still in place and have them release the fish. So it just kind of depends on the circumstances. If it's somebody that it's obvious that they didn't have a clue, uh, you know, it was, I, I don't know, some some lady that's taking her little kids out fishing or something, you know, I just, I kind of look at the circumstances. They give us a lot of discretion on when we can do whatever we do.
Warden, I had a question about um, gathering of, uh, well, I guess in specific, like bird feathers. You take your kid or your grandkid out to the uh, local park, neighborhood park, or heck, even if in your own yard. And what kid isn't curious about, you know, picking up and looking at feathers? And a lot of kids would love to, to keep them. But what is the reason behind not being able to pick up like a random feather that obviously you're not taking off a bird, you're finding it on the ground. Uh, uh, so what would you, for example, what would you tell your kid why you're not supposed to do that? Um, you know, I'd probably get back to the, the whole late 1800s, early 1900s, and, and so many birds were being taken for feathers that the law came into place that said quit messing with feathers and, um, and it's still a law, it never went away. And uh, I don't know if I had a kid, I'd, I'd probably explain that to him. And, and then uh, we'd have fun with him looking at the feather and holding it. And, and then we'd talk about that, you know, it's not really legal. And then I'd help him go put that feather back where, where he found it. But the okay, big, any more, you know, any the more big questions? Thing, I would just say the big thing on feathers, though, is, you know, the main things are like hawk feathers and eagle feathers, um, things like that, talons. Other questions for Harry? Okay, well, thank you so much, Harry, as usual, very informative. Everybody here is clapping. All right, appreciate it. Well, thank you very much. Enjoy seeing you again. And take care. Clint just walked through the door, so he's waving. Okay. <laughs> Good deal. So right. I'm gonna let you go. Okay, thank we're gonna let you go. Okay, so. don't need to do anything with these buttons down here. Yeah, you, you can just close the window. That's good. Okay. Thank you so much and Bye. we appreciate you. You bet. Take care. Bye now. And we'll go ahead and do a 10 minute break and then we'll be back with uh, the herpetologist from the Glass Porter Zoo, Clint Dardar. Guad I used to say, I, I knew how to say it. Guadiana. Okay. <laughs> I said it right before you got here. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Everybody in this room, we're gonna get started. Um, so tonight we're very lucky to have Clint from the Gladys Porter Zoo. He's the um, curator of herpetology and the chief safety officer there. And he's worked there since 2010. And um, he's currently oversees the day-to-day -day maintenance of over 400 reptiles, amphibians, and invertebrates. That's a lot. That sounds like a lot to me, okay? Um, before joining the Gladys Porter Zoo, he worked at the Phoenix Herpetological Society in Arizona, and he was in charge of 150 venomous snakes and lizards. And he used to be known as a snake buster. And he'd frequently remove in, uh, nuisance reptiles from people's residences or businesses. So, sounds like he knows what he's doing and we're so glad he's here tonight. And at the end, he's got a couple friends with him, so you'll get a chance to see them. So, welcome Clint and I'll hand across the microphone. Awesome, thank you so much. And you can, yeah, just clip it. Okay, welcome. Um, we're going to be talking about the herps of the Rio Grande Valley. Do you guys all know what herps means? No? Okay. I know, snickering. I've heard all the jokes. Let's see, this arrow is not working here. Or do I have to click the. Oh, no, I'm just to click on the active slide. All right. Okay, so herp is short for herpetology. Okay, so herpetology is 
uh, basically the study of reptiles and amphibians. Okay, you got ornithology, ichthyology, things like that. This herpetology is for reptiles and amphibians. Okay, so we say herp for short. Um, when we go out looking for reptiles, trying to find them in the wild, we call it herping. Okay, just like there's birding, fishing, hunting, herping. Terrible, terrible name. Uh, but there's a few ways to that we go. People like me go look for reptiles. One is hiking trails or going in the mountains. Not here, of course. Um, then there's road cruising for snakes and other reptiles. So you could cruise FM roads, old, old you know roads in the middle of nowhere, and basically cruise slow at night and wait for snakes to cross. A lot of times, snakes will be basking on the road, which is a terrible idea. I find a whole lot more ran over snakes than I do live ones, unfortunately. Um, so they like the warmth of the road, so they'll hang out there a lot. And then unfortunately they can get ran over. But uh, it makes it an easy way to kind of try to observe these guys in the wild and get a better idea of their numbers, which is what I do. I document all the, the herps I find, um, usually to iNaturalists. I'm sure you guys are familiar with that. Um, and so if you're out, and you see a snake on the road or, or a dead snake on the road, it's important that you still try to document it. Um, it could be a rare species. It could be a range extension. So even a ran over snake, if you see one, take a photo of it, upload it to iNaturalist. Um, and uh, I think it's important, at least with reptiles, to obscure your location that you upload to iNaturalist. Um, the reason for that is because sometimes there's a lot of collectors that will come down, especially if it's a rare snake, a pretty snake. If you post it, open GPS coordinates on it, then it kind of gives people a, a way to hunt for them. And unfortunately, there's a lot of that in the hobby. People go and they may find, they find your observation and then they'll go to that spot, look for those snakes, find them, and then collect them. Um, or just take too many of them from a site. And so it's important if you're going to post INAP, I recommend obscure your location. Um, another way is flipping for snakes and other reptiles. So that's, if you could see there, there's a, a snake there under this corrugated sheet metal. Um, this is just on old farm field and abandoned buildings that I found. And it's a great way to observe snakes and other, other stuff too. I've, I've flipped all kinds of mammals too, raccoons, possums, uh, armadillos, unfortunately a couple skunks as well. That was not fun. Luckily, I didn't get uh, sprayed. But um, yeah, they utilize this stuff. Uh, unfortunately, it's a lot of it's just trash, but snakes will use it, and it actually provides a lot of shelter for them from predators and things like that. And um, what this corrugated sheet metal does, especially when it's stacked up, like I made this stack, it actually, I call them like little snake mansions, OK? so. Basically, the more you stack it up, the more thermal gradient it has, meaning the, the, the sheets closer to the top would be hotter because it's exposed to the sun. The ones lower would be cooler. So snakes will actually move up and down these things um, to get warmer or cooler, or sometimes at the bottom it's more humid for them. Uh, so I would love to do a study on that, and I wish there was a way you could actually see what the snakes were doing. Um, like, I don't know, like put a snake with there with like x-ray or something would be really neat to see what they do with different, different temperatures and things like that. But anyways, that's what I do. I go and set these things everywhere. And uh, a lot of times they produce snakes. Um, sometimes they don't. And a lot of times when I set these, they sometimes take years to produce anything. Um, a lot of things have to happen where the prey items have to move in first. Um, there, there's a certain amount of seasoning that happens uh, over a, a couple years or or different um, seasons. Um, but anyways, that's just some methods to find reptiles. Um, and we're gonna be focusing mainly on the, the herps of the Rio Grande Valley, okay? So I call the Rio Grande Valley the, the southern four most counties. So Star to the west, Hidalgo, Willacy, and Cameron, okay? This, this whole area, oh, we're not gonna go that yet. The, the Rio Grande Valley is very fortunate, just like a lot of birds um, that are specialists down here. You have a lot of reptiles, especially snakes, that barely make it into the United States via the Rio Grande Valley. 
meaning they're prevalent through Central America and Mexico, and then their northernmost range is here in the valley. So that's, that's pretty special. And there are groups of people that actually travel from all around the world to come here to look for some of these species. Just like you have people coming all, all over for birding and, and hunting and fishing, there are a much smaller group of people that look for reptiles, um, but there are, they do come here. So in the valley, we have 30 species of non-venomous snakes, actually over, um, and then only three species of venomous snakes, okay? Which are two rattlesnake species and then the Texas coral snake, so one coral snake, all right? So the majority of snakes you would find possibly down here would be harmless, non-venomous, okay? Amphibians, we have 15 species of frogs and toads and three species of salamanders, okay? Lizards, a lot of lizards, 16 species, and including four invasive geckos. I'm sure you guys all know about the Mediterranean geckos you see on your porch by the light or whatever. Those are here, of course. They're not supposed to be. And, but we actually have three more species that's been documented down here as well. So turtles and tortoises, not too many down here, especially compared to other places in Texas. So we got five species of turtles, one species of tortoise, and then uh, five species of sea turtles, of course, in the ocean. Here's some range maps from some species down here, and this is what I was talking about. They barely make it into Texas and the United States, just down in the southernmost range, um, which makes this area unique for uh, reptiles, for sure. So we'll start with uh, the most, most infamous one, which is the western diamondback rattlesnake. So this is the most common venomous snake we have down here. They like it, uh, I guarantee you, I don't want to startle anyone, but there's probably some around these grounds. This is perfect habitat for them. They like the, kind of the drier regions of the valley. They're even found on South Padre Island. And uh, yeah, they are pretty common. Bites are very rare from this species. Um, and venomous snakes in general, generally, I'll go over some snake bite stuff. But usually, you guys doing your stuff out in nature, as long as you stay on trails and you don't try to mess with the venomous snake, you'll be totally fine, okay? This is its smaller cousin. This is called the Desert Massasauga rattlesnake. These guys max out maybe 18 to 20 inches long. So they're very small, very rare. Um, I've only found a handful of these guys in 13 years of being down here. Uh, and they like it a lot further west and um, where it's very sandy. So through the sand sheet of Star County, Brooks County, Jim Hogg County, that's where they're more prevalent. But there are some records in Cameron County of these guys too, maybe out towards Boca Chica uh, Beach and things like that that could be found. Of course, how you identify a rattlesnake is by the rattle they have on their tail. And... It's a misconception that you can tell the age of a rattlesnake by how many segments it has on its rattle. That's a myth. Rattlesnakes create that segment each time they shed their skin, and they can shed their skin four times a year possibly. So you can have a one-year-old snake that would have four segments on their rattle, okay? And sometimes they break off and things like that. So sometimes you'll have a, you can have a 10-year-old snake with just one segment, so. Um, Rattlesnakes are unique because they have these organs here, which are called um, L'Oreal heat pits. So these guys use this organ to detect the body heat of their prey item, which is usually rodents, so rats and mice, okay? And also for predators, warm-blooded predators. So even complete darkness, they can, they can sense the heat of whatever they're hunting. And then we have the Texas coral snake down here. They could also be around these grounds or in any of the refuges. They like it a little bit more moist, so they're prevalent around the Rio Grande, um, kind of the more subtropical region of South Texas. Um, and they're part of the elapid family. Do you guys know what elapids are? Any, any other? Yeah, I know you do. What other elapids are around the world? Yeah, so the cobras, mambas, like the black mamba in Africa, um, the inland taipan, which is the most venomous snake in the world from Australia, sea snakes, those are all elapids. So the, this coral snake is part of that family. 
This is the Mexican milk snake. This is the one that mimics the coral snake. Okay. And these guys are pretty rare down here. I only find a handful a year, um, but uh, they definitely like the little bit moist, more moist areas as well, just like the coral snake. Um, and does anyone know the rhyme? Coral snake, mel snake? Yeah, so that, that was pretty good. Here is the rhyme, okay? I don't teach the rhyme because most people can't remember it. And if you see this snake, you're in a panic, you're not going to remember that rhyme. And not that you'd pick it up anyways, but I just say, if you see a colorful snake with these pat this pattern, don't pick it up. <laughs> okay. Uh, this is the bull snake. This mimics rattlesnakes. So they will actually flatten their head, rattle their tail, hiss, make it sound like they're a rattlesnake. Um, and, uh, but they are completely harmless. We do have them here. They're one of the largest snakes in the whole United States. They can get almost eight feet long. Okay, so they get big, and they're mostly, um, oh, somebody guessed the rhyme. Um, they're mostly rodent eaters, but they will also, a lot of people don't like them, especially at ranches, because they sneak into their, their chicken coop and take care of their chickens or the eggs. Yep, like I said, they get really big. This one was pushing about seven feet long. Nope, so this is the bull snake. The one that mimics rats. See, it looks a lot like one, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's their defense, so things don't mess with them. You guys all heard of this snake before? No? Te Texas indigo snake. So this is, a, this is part of the, um, the, them and the eastern indigo snake are the longest snakes in the United States. So they get very big. Um, here's a, a good sized one. Yeah. There's, there's a real big one. So these guys are awesome snakes to have around. They are harmless, um, and, but they like eating rattlesnakes. What's that? Yeah, so, so if you guys see these guys in your yard or property, they're great to have around. They eat rattlesnakes. They also eat rats and mice and just basically everything you don't want around your house, okay? Um, they were protected in Texas, but they actually just got lifted off that protection list. Um, and, but most people appreciate them uh, because, like I said, they eat rattlesnakes. So have you guys heard of the cottonmouth or water moccasin? Okay. So we do not have those in the Rio Grande Valley. I get people claiming all the time that we do, but they do not make it south of Nueces County, which is where Corpus Christi is. Okay, that's kind of the southern tip of their range, okay? So rest assured, we do not have these here in the valley. What we do have is something that looks a lot like them, which is the diamondback water snake. So these guys are prevalent in the Rosacas, uh, even in neighborhoods, they, they can be found. And they look a lot like cottonmouths, but they are harmless. So if you see a snake that looks like this in our waterways down here, rest assured it is not dangerous, okay? They, they usually eat fish and amphibians. So these are some of the more common snakes. We're not going to go too much into them. Um, but the most common snake probably is the Great Plains rat snake, which is the first one here. And then you got the ribbon snakes, which like to hang out by water. Decays brown snakes, they get like 10 inches long, that's it. And then the diamondback water snake's a very common snake, especially in the waterways. Here's another pretty common snake, too. This is the Texas patch nose snake. Um, they're all over here. They're at Palo Alto. They're at Laguna Atascosa. All, they're very common. They're lizard eaters, and um, they are very fast animals. So now we're getting into the real cool stuff, the rare stuff. All right. This is called the speckled racer. This is one of those species that people travel all over, from all over the world to come to the valley to see. Okay. They're barely in two counties in the whole United States, which is Cameron and Hidalgo. That's it. That's their entire range in the U.S. What was that? Speckled racer. Yeah. Here's some other photos. Yeah, so they're inhabitants of the, the palm forest around the Rio Grande River. 
And one of the refuges you could see them at is Sable Palm Sanctuary. Have you guys heard of that place? Okay, if you haven't been there, please go. It's a beautiful place. I think it's the best chunk of habitat we have left down here in the RGV. They are diurnal lizard eaters, but they'll also eat amphibians and basically anything they can catch. Yeah, there's a few of them I was able to find. I believe that's two, two males in pursuit of the larger female. Um, so that was pretty lucky. I've never seen three in, <laughs> side by side. This is a very rare snake down here. This is the Tamalipan hook nose snake. They call them hook nose snakes. They got a little hook on the end of their nose, and that is because they are burrowers. They use that as a shovel to um, bury in the sand, essentially, and look for their prey items, which are actually spiders, centipedes, scorpions, uh, and mainly bugs. Yeah. So Mexican racer. Um, this one was actually found not too far from here. Uh, so they like uh, the thorn scrub. They're dry, loving um, animals, and they are lizard eaters. Very fast snakes. This is another very rare species down here. This is the cat-eyed snake. This snake ranges all the way down to Panama. Okay, this species all the way down to Panama, almost to South America, but they're in our backyard here. Pretty remarkable. Called cat-eyed snakes for obvious reasons. They have elliptical pupil, and they're not a dangerous snake. So you can't identify venomous snakes versus non-venomous by their eye. Don't do it. Um, but what people think is the round pupils mean non-venomous, elliptical pupils mean venomous. But there's a whole bunch of snakes that don't fit that bill. Okay, not that you guys aren't going to get close enough to look at their eyeballs anyways. I'm just saying some of the misconceptions out there. Uh, these guys are very common around neighborhoods and, and backyards. They like under planters and, and pots and things like that. They're a small snake that only gets uh, maybe 10 inches, maybe a little bit bigger, 15 inches. But uh, they are protected in the state of Texas. This is another species that is all throughout Mexico and Central America and barely makes it into Texas. Yeah. Anyone seen these guys before? Yeah, you think so? Yeah, they're pretty common in certain areas, especially when there's moisture. So that we have a couple whip snake species down here. They call them whip snakes because you want me to go back to the previous slide? Are you taking a photo? Okay. A um, couple whip snake species, and these guys are diurnal lizard eaters. They're very fast, and they have very big eyes, which means they're visual predators, right? Um, and then this is the other one, which is, oh, I didn't put a caption, but this is a Schatz whip snake. These ones are found further west. The Rufin's whip snake is only found in three counties, which is Cameron, Willisie, Hidalgo. Uh, they are amphibian eaters, but they eat bugs as well. Yeah. Long nose snake. Um, these guys are getting more and more uncommon. I used to find them a lot when I first moved here. I don't know what's going on with them, but they're 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 hard to find nowadays. I'm not really sure. Yeah, but they are lizard eaters by trade. We have a couple species of black-headed snake. These guys are tiny. They're maybe the size of a pencil. Okay, this is, I didn't put a caption, dang it. Um, plain, this is a plains black-headed snake, and then this is a flat-headed snake. So they almost look, look the same. Slight differences. The black-headed snake likes the thorn scrub more, uh, and the flat-headed snake likes the sand. So that's basically the only difference. They're actually centipede and scorpion eaters. This is the Texas horn lizard, also known as a horny toad. Have you guys ever seen these guys in the wild? Yeah, yeah, they're awesome. They're, th they're protected in the state of Texas as well. Um, they are in trouble because they're, basically their food is going away. These are harvester ants, okay? These are the ones that clear a lot of, you'll see them carrying all kinds of stuff back to their hole. Um, they're the large red ones. Um, they're basically harmless. They're beneficial to the ecosystem. So if you see these in your yard, please leave them be. They are good to have around. Um, however, the invasive fire ant, which are these black ones, heal harvester ants. 
So they're wiping out the food source for Texas horn lizards. Okay, and they also eat the Texas horn li lizard's eggs. So they lay them close to the, ma the ant mounds um, so that the babies have something to eat when they hatch. And the fire ants are taken advantage and then they wipe out the eggs. So they wipe out generations at a time. So kill the fire ants, leave the harvester ants. Okay. Now we're getting into lizards. Well, we already did. Texas horn lizard, but this is another threatened species down here that a lot of people don't know we have. This is a reticulated collared lizard. Okay. They get pretty big. Males get almost 12 inches long. Anyone know what these guys eat? Any guesses? You already heard this presentation, so you can't, you can't say it. <laughs> nope. Toads? I bet they would, but no, that's not their primary thing. They actually eat other lizards. They'll even eat smaller ones of their own kind. Yeah. Yeah, that's what they like. I don't know why. I'm sure you guys have seen these guys, right? These are those fast lizards you see all around when it's really hot out. Be like 100 degrees, and these guys are having a field day. These are whiptail lizards. So we have we have a few species down here, but this is the most common one, um, and they eat bugs, and so they're good to have around. Very fast. <clears throat> these guys are also very common around houses. This is the four-line skink. This one's pretty unique because you could tell it has two tails essentially. So a lot of times, lizards that regrow their tails, that was probably just a wound that it had, so it started growing another tail. So I, I see them sometimes like this, but um, yeah, this was pretty crazy to see too. This is the most common lizard we have down here. This is the Texas spiny lizard. You see them a lot on trees, on buildings. Um, they're bug eaters, very common. Um, and uh, yeah, good to have around. This is their lesser known cousin, the blue spiny lizard. This is a typical look. If you want to observe these guys, go to Benson State Park, if you've been there before in Mission. Um, they're pretty common on the red brick wall that's there. This kind of ugly one, I must admit, but they do get pretty. Um, and then there's just some spectacular ones that are down here as well. Blue spiny lizard. And then, believe it or not, we have a legless lizard down here. This is a lizard that looks a lot like a snake. Yeah, but uh, main difference is it's a lizard. It has uh, eyelids, which snakes don't have eyelids, um, and they have ears. Snakes don't have ears, but lizards do. Um, this is kind of, was caught in mid-evolution, right? It was basically from a, a lizard moving into a snake, essentially. So it, was, it lost its limbs because it's mostly a burrowing species, which doesn't need the limbs underground. Um, so these guys like the sand sheets of Willisey, a little bit north of Hidalgo and Star County. Okay, pretty cool species we have down here. All right, amphibian time. This is my favorite amphibian we got down here. This is the Mexican burrowing toad. These guys, uh, these guys are right at home in the rainforest in Costa Rica, but somehow they make it here. And strangely, they like the drier regions of the valley, it's like Star County, and then into Zapata. Um, but they wait. These guys really rely on hurricanes and heavy down, downpours from storms, thunderstorms. These guys will spend basically the whole year underground and wait for floods. When the floods come, they just, in mass numbers, breed. Females lay their eggs, go back underground for the rest of the year. You may see them once a year, if that. If it's a drought or dry year, they can actually stay underground for as long as it takes until the water comes. Here's some more photos of them. They are just bizarre animals. So these, I'm going to get into our three salamander species. Okay, this is one. This is the black spotted newt. And these guys are pretty special. They are mainly found underground but when it floods, they're found in water. That's where they lay their eggs. And they are of all, we have several newt species in the United States. These are the ones that uh, most of the newt species are aquatic. So they spend their life in the water. These guys spend most of their life underground. So pretty unique species. 
And they do this weird thing when they're threatened called the Unken reflex, where they will flash their, their bright undersides basically as a warning to predators not to eat them. They're trying to make you think they're toxic. Okay, yeah, it's, it's bizarre. And this is the Rio Grande Siren. A lot of people catch these on fishing lines and think that they're eels of some sort, but they're actually a salamander. And we have them right here in the valley, and they get big. They get like almost three feet long. Yeah. And these guys are fully aquatic. They cannot survive on land. If they're on land too long, they dry up and they'll die. They have gills. You can't see it in this photo, but they have gills, and that's how they breathe underwater. They also absorb a lot of oxygen from the water through their skin. Uh, and then in times of drought, when their water bodies dry up, they will actually bury. And this is going to sound gross, but they basically encase themselves in mucus, okay, in a mucus ball, which keeps them moist. And then they'll go to basically like a uh, dormant state where they're not using any energy, and they could stay underground for possibly years with, without coming up, without eating, drinking, anything. So if it's severe drought, they can survive it. Once the rain comes, they come up, get what they need, breed, and if they have to, they'll go back underground. Very bizarre species. They also only have front legs. They have no back legs. Uh, vibration. Vibration from the rain. And then also their, their burrows would get flooded, and then they, they make their way out. Um, a couple times we've had them donated to the zoo because people were ex excavating, you know, with a tractor, like an old pond or whatever at their property, and then they, like, pull these things up, and they're like, what the heck is this? Probably think it's an alien. And then um, they'll call us, send us a photo. We're like, yeah, that's a siren. Bring, bring it on. Because, uh, yeah, we, we, we have a few there on exhibit at the zoo. And, uh, yeah, it's uh, pretty neat that they can survive completely dry, even though they're a fully aquatic animal. Yeah. This is the tiger salamander. This is our last salamander we have here in the valley. This is an adult. Um, this is what they look like when they're babies, when they're larvae, they actually have gills and they're fully aquatic. And then they slowly lose that and then they come up on land. Yeah. Pretty common, this is the couch's spadefoot toad. This is, the males and females look a little different. The male is the one on the, uh, on the back there, and that's the female. Um, he is latched onto her in what's called amplexus. Okay, that is how frogs and toads breed. The male basically glue themselves to the female. Okay, literally glue themselves. Yeah, they produce a glue-like substance that sticks on, so there's nothing she can do. Okay, um, once he's on there. Anyways, and then um, that's how they breed. Lay their eggs in the water. Create a bunch more spadefoot toads, okay? This is the most common amphibian we have down here, probably. This is the Gulf Coast toad. Have you guys seen these guys in your yard? Um, yeah, they're very common. Some could get pretty big. The females get almost like the size of a cheeseburger. This may actually be the most common frog we have down here. This is the leopard frog, Rio Grande leopard frog. If you're walking by a pond or a rasaka and you hear a bunch of splashes, a lot of times it's these guys hopping in. <clears throat> This is a super rare frog. This is probably the rarest frog we have down here. Um, I was in Belize like 10 years ago, and these were everywhere. Very common down there. But as they come north, they get more and more rare. And this is the furthest north they come. So these are another species that rely on the thunderstorms, flooding, hurricanes. If you want to find these guys, just go out in a hurricane. <laughs> just kidding. Don't do that. Uh, sheep frog, also another species that barely makes it into the country here. Bizarre animals. Okay, so we are getting into the turtles and tortoises now. This is the Texas tortoise. Uh, this is the only tortoise we have here in Texas, and luckily we have them down here. They like a little bit more drier regions. Um, a good place to observe them is Palo Alto Battlefield. Um, in fact, they do tortoise surveys there for them, and they've, I, I think they've, they've marked like over 200 tortoises there. Yeah, and um, so very cool species. Herbivores, they like eating prickly pear cactus, and they especially like when 
the fruit is, is on top of those cactus, the prickly pear fruit. That's their favorite. This is a red-eared slider. These are those ones you see in our resacas a lot, um, basking and swimming. Uh, this is a, a mostly aquatic turtle. They're invasive almost all over the world, and especially all over the United States. But in the Rio Grande Valley, this is their native range. A lot of people don't know that. They think that they're uh, released pets, but they're supposed to be here. I'm originally from Arizona, and they, they, they were a big problem there because they're all released pets there, and they're out competing all the rare native turtles because um, they breed like crazy, and then they just eat everything. Uh, but here, they're supposed to be here. And this bizarre one, the spiny softshell turtle, we got these down here too. And the females get giant, they get huge. They look like big old pancakes. Um, if you guys want to go to the zoo, this is a good place to see these guys, as well as the red-eared sliders. Um, a lot of times, early morning sun, you'll see these guys basking. Also looks like it has mosquitoes on it. I didn't notice that. Flies and mosquitoes. Softshells? I don't know. They're everywhere at the zoo. I don't know about the whole... Yeah. Yeah, they're, they're pretty common down here. They got a big range, though. They make it all the way to, to Florida. So I don't know about the entire range. Down here, they seem pretty, pretty stable. So I'm not sure. And of course, we got American alligators. <coughs> um, and uh, yeah, pretty self explanatory. But the most, pretty much the most dangerous time to be around these guys is when females are nesting. They get very defensive uh, over their nest site. That's how I found my first gator down here. I didn't know it, but I saw it in the water, so I tried to go around the bank to get a better photo, and this thing just charged at me. I'm like, what is going on? And then I noticed that it had a nest full of eggs right by it, and I was like, that's cool. Cool way to see my first gator. Um, but uh, yeah, really cool animals. Sometimes there are situations like this, um, but luckily, they don't, so at least, you know, I, I'm in Brownsville, and I have not heard of these guys being there yet, but they're in Bayview, um, out at, you know, I guess they make it to the island too, right? Yeah, so they, they're like, they like the eastern part of the valley here, um, and to my knowledge, they haven't made it that far south to Brownsville, but I have heard of reports that they're in the Rio Grande, so I don't know. Whether they got there naturally or someone released them, don't know. Okay, I guess, um, yeah, so I'll just briefly talk about snake bite, okay? This is kind of just information, general information, if a snake bite was to occur, kind of what you do, and a little bit of information about different venoms and such. Definitely don't do this. This is one of the leading causes of snake bites is people trying to pin them, okay? It's pretty common sense, the closer your fingers are getting to those fangs, the more dangerous it is. So definitely not. And this is the most common reason people get bitten by snakes. They get pretty brave. They, they try to pick them up. This is a friend of mine that did a study where he made an artificial leg and boot, and he'd go around gently stepping on rattlesnakes to see what they, they do. It's, People probably think you step on a rattlesnake, you're going to get bit, right? Well, his studies, his findings, only 8% actually struck that artificial boot, okay? Almost 80% um, didn't rattle at all at him, and most of them just try to run, try to flee. That's what rattlesnakes do, okay? They are not looking to bite us. We are too big um, for them to eat, so they're not interested in wasting their venom on us, okay? They want to get away. They do not want to be detected. A lot of times they won't rattle until they're discovered and being messed with, okay? Um, they just want to get away. Even when they're stepped on, they just try to get away. Um, this is kind of what, what they did as well. Um, see, almost 90% of them tried to escape, okay? Um, when they were being harassed. This, sorry, so this is after they were discovered, right? He stepped on them, then they knew something was up. Still, only just over 10% actually struck at him. 
And this was 200 rattlesnakes he did this with. So, yeah. In summary, they just want to get away. They don't want to mess with you. If a bite was to occur, main thing is just get to the hospital as soon as possible. If you were the one that got bit on accident, don't drive yourself. Um, call paramedics to come get you, or if you have someone to drive, just get to the hospital as soon as possible. Remove uh, rings, bracelets, things like that, because what happens is you start swelling up, okay, with snake bite um, and any venomous bite in general, right? Bee stings, ant bites, whatever. You start swelling, you got to take off jewelry, okay? That's the fang of a coral snake. I just throw this in there because a lot of people have the misconception that coral snakes are rear fanged or they have fangs too small to bite you. That's not true. They absolutely can bite and penetrate your skin. Um, they have front fixed fangs, which means it doesn't move. Like rattlesnakes have switch, switch blade fangs, so they switch out whenever they open their mouth and strike. Um, so these guys know they don't have to chew to bite you. Uh, they have a better chance of getting to you if they chew on you, of course, but they could absolutely just a single strike and give you venom, okay? Again, they're not looking to do that, okay? Especially coral snakes. You have to really be messing with them to get them to bite. Um, they are very secretive and shy animals. They do not want confrontation with humans or predators, yeah? Um, when you're out in the field, uh, if you are worried about hiking around venomous snakes, always wear pants, wear good shoes, clothes shoes, don't wear sandals, um, don't wear shorts when you're out there. And even added protection, you could get snake gaiters, snake boots, you know, shin guards to help protect you if you're worried about that. But main thing is just stay on trails, watch where you put your hands and feet at all times when you're in nature, and you'll be just fine. Yeah, just examples that rattlesnakes like tall grass. So if you don't want to run into them, avoid tall grass. And if uh, you don't want to run your property, good idea to clean up brush piles, old debris that you don't need around, especially right up against your house. That's what the rodents like, which will then draw in the snakes. Okay. This is a product that you may have seen in Home Depot, Lowe's, they sell it. It's about 80 or 90 bucks for a five gallon bucket. It is useless. Don't waste your money. There's been studies shown that snakes don't care about it. It's like granules that if you sprinkle around your yard, it's supposed to repel snakes, especially rattlesnakes. It doesn't. And especially right when you got your first rain, all that stuff goes away, gets washed away, it's, it's useless. Waste of money. You may have seen some of these photos or ones like it. Uh, yeah, that's probably, a, those are probably big snakes, um, but they're not as big as it looks. Okay, it's a little bit of trick photography. It's the old hold the fish you caught out in front of you for the photo and it looks 10 times bigger. Okay, that's the same stuff snake he's holding right by him compared to out in front of him. Okay, so yeah, don't get fooled. Just some places, if you're interested in, in observing reptiles down here, here, this is my favorite. This is Sable Palm Sanctuary. Um, it's a beautiful, that's an old uh, plantation home uh, that they've renovated as their visitor center. And it's right along the Rio Grande, as you can see here. And it's just a lush palm forest. It looks like you're in the rainforests, rainforest of Veracruz or or into Costa Rica. It's just an amazing chunk of habitat. And remember, this is the, one of the best places to observe the speckled racer, okay, that really pretty blue snake. Another place, Santa Ana Wildlife Refuge is awesome. It's over there in, um, I guess it's Alamo or Westlaco. Uh, great place. Uh, a lot of indigo snakes there, a lot of good stuff there. And I'm plugging the Gladys Porter Zoo. Please come by and see us, okay? We do have some native reptiles there too, um, but we also have our reptile house, which is where I work, and uh, we have a lot of native species there, but uh, tons of exotic stuff like king cobras, gaboon vipers, komodo dragons. Um, we have six crocodilian species there. So a lot of good stuff to see. Please come see us. Um, 
If you're not quite sure of that snake you see out in the field, here's some resources you can utilize. You could, you could put it on iNaturalist and usually they'll give you an identification pretty, pretty fast. It works pretty well. Um, Texas Parks Wildlife website has, has some good identification resources. Um, there is a Facebook group that you could join, South Texas Snake ID. It's a pretty good one. You just put a photo on there, what is this snake, um, and say its location and someone will get back to you pretty soon. Um, this is a field guide. I think it's the best field guide for Texas reptiles and amphibians. Um, it's on Amazon. It's like 35 bucks. And all else fails, you can email me, okay? I like uh, identifying snakes that you, get, that you find out in your yard or wherever. But that's my email address. If you guys are interested in sending me an email if you find crazy snake or something like that, okay? Clint at G, am I in the way? I'm sorry. Clint at gpz.org. Yep. And that's pretty much it. Do we want to do this first or do we want to do questions first? Okay. Anyone in the room have questions first? Yes. I don't really know the answer to that one. Um, I would think it's probably based on what they hunt. Um, I know that those spadefoot toads, they kind of have eyes on top of their head, and that's mostly because they are burrowers. So they probably just poke their heads out and wait for prey items. And also, like leopard frogs, the same thing. They, they're more aquatic eyes so because they, they live in the water, so they have... Um, more adapted to water is my guess. Yeah. Yes, sir. Of what? Yes. Um, so that what he's asking is uh, there is a amphibian disease. Um, there's a couple different types of chytrid fungus diseases. Um, so it has not been documented um, here. Now. That's not to say it's not here. The last surveys were done in 2012, so it probably needs to be done. What that is is it's a it's a it's a bad uh, fungal disease that amphibians can get. Especially, it, it originated in Asia, and those species can take it. But the ones on the other side of the world that's not used to it, which would be the New World here, um, it just it, it can wipe them out. It just it wreaks havoc on them, and they can die from it. Um, so luckily, we haven't seen a lot of evidence down here of that. Um, there is other places in Texas and all over the United States that's suffering from it. Um, and so that brings up a good point. If I mean, I don't think you guys are going to be going around in ponds looking for frogs, but it's important if you're going to go from site to site to uh, disinfect tools, dip nets, uh, boot, boots if you have to. Um, but again, I don't know what you guys are going to be doing. But what I do is when I go look for frogs, I have a bottle, a spray bottle of bleach solution in, in my vehicle at all times. So uh, also with my hands. So if I'm going from, a, from one pond to the next, I disinfect before going to the next site, just in case there is some kind of disease potential. I'm not transferring it to different locations. Um, it was UTRGV back when it was UTB. Um, and then uh, in coordination with San Antonio Zoo uh, Conservation Center. Yep. <laughs> okay, so the lime green one and these could be both the same snake because they come in different shades of green. But usually when someone tells me they saw a bright green snake down here, I, don't, I didn't have a slide of it, but it's called a rough green snake. So you can Google that. They are a snake that does go on the ground, but they live most of their life in the trees. And they are bug eaters. Um, they don't get very big. And uh, they're a very cool species that we have down here. Um, I couldn't put every species we have down here because we'd be here for like four hours. 
So some of my I, I missed. Um, the other one that's in the grass that's kind of green that's fast is probably a whip snake. Yeah, probably the Rufin's whip snake is my guess. But without a photo, I can't really say for sure. Probably talk about the one on the belly. The black striped snake is what I'm guessing. That was the orange one. Um, so that's kind of a defensive mechanism. So when a black striped snake is, or it could be that cat-eyed snake. Both of those are the only two orange snakes that went over. Both of them, basically in nature, when there's bright colors, it's a it's an alarm, danger. It's why coral snakes are their color. Um, a lot of things that are venomous in the ocean, like blue ringed octopus, um, they're colorful. It's a warning. So a lot of times, um, snakes will develop bright colors to warn predators, don't mess with me, I may be venomous. That's why the milk snake mimics the coral snake, right? It's not venomous, but it wants you to think it is. Yep. Oh yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Yeah, this is another reason why you don't want to focus on that rhyme for the coral snakes. The red touches yellow, kills a fellow. Um, I'll, I'll get there eventually. Um, but there is the snake he's bringing up, which is the long-nosed snake, which actually has red touches yellow, but it's not a venomous snake. Really, the only place that rhyme may work is Florida, and that's where it originated. But again, sometimes you have coral snakes or whatever that are have aberrant patterns where they'll be almost all black. And they'll have bizarre patterns that doesn't follow the rhyme anyways. So stand by, stand by. A lot of photos. Uh, it's coming up. There you go. Can you see that? So it's not as prominent as coral snakes, but technically the, the red is touching the yellow or the white there. Um, and again, this is a non-venomous snake that also mimics coral snakes. So if you saw this snake, unfortunately this guy, now with humans dominating the, the earth, they're going to see this snake and they think it's a coral and they're probably going to kill it, which is unfortunate. Um, a lot of times you don't need to kill venomous snakes, even at your house, if they're around. Um, what did that, no matter how many venomous snakes you would kill at your property, it will not get rid of them all. Okay? And actually, studies have shown when you, like uh, things like coyotes, okay? If you keep shooting coyotes, they will actually breed more to keep their populations up. Okay? So you start wiping out snakes, they're going to compensate and breed more uh, to keep their numbers up. So you're actually creating more snakes for your, for your yard. So keep that in mind. Okay? Yes? Um, so you could call the zoo. Uh, we do have a rehab center. There's not too many places that take snakes and her herps in general, um, but we will if we need to. A lot of times, if it's not bad, it's best to just leave them. Um, but of course, if they are wounded, we will accept it at the zoo um, and we'll do our best. But sometimes, especially like if they're hit by cars, it's pretty much over, unfortunately. Um, but we get a number of turtles and tortoises that get hit by cars. They're the one thing that can withstand it. They still, a lot of times, can die. But we've had ones with just smashed shells, and we're able to surgically repair it. And they do pretty good. And some of them eventually even get released. So yeah, so, the zoo is a possible option. We do. Well, I don't have a, that's a great question. So anyone know what parthenogenic is? Yeah, so it's basically when a female snake can, can have uh, babies without a male. Okay, so the only one, we have two, actually two. Um, they are called blind snakes. I should have put them in here. They are a tiny little snake. They're actually part of the genus of the world's smallest snake. Um, and we have two species down here, the Texas blind snake and the, uh, the Indo-Pacific blind snake. The Indo-Pacific is invasive. It's not supposed to be here. They are black. They're very small. Um, 
but um, they can produce babies without a male present. Pretty cool stuff. We also have one of those invasive geckos um, that can do that as well. Uh, they don't need a male. Could be all females and they still have live young. You see that a lot in island species. So like Komodo dragons. Komodo dragons can lay perfectly good eggs without ever being with a male, just like Jurassic Park. That was the whole premise of Jurassic Park was they introduced frog DNA to the animals and they said, oh, no worries, all the dinosaurs are female. But with that frog DNA, this is all fictional, of course, but, um, but some frog can reproduce asexually, parthogenically, so it created babies. Yeah. It's a little tweak on that, but it, it is a real thing. Anything else? Yeah. Yeah, it is, it is toxic to humans. Most of the time, it's not dangerous. Um, I don't know if you plan on going and licking toads, but uh, <laughs> the, the, um, they have basically uh, a toxin they secrete from glands right behind their eyes, um, and that's for predators. Now, it may just give us like a, a, a stomach ache, mild stomach ache. It's not any big deal. But what it does affect is dogs. Dogs have a hard time with it. Canines, that's mainly what it's battling against, like coyotes, things like that. Um, and so unfortunately, dogs, it's pretty rough on them. Most of the time, they can make it. Um, I forgot to do a marine toad. So we have a giant toad down here that gets like this big. Um, they're also called cane toads. Have you guys heard of cane toads before? So I, I don't like preaching it because people will start killing them because they think they're going to kill their dogs, and they think that they're invasive. But actually, cane toads, only native range in the United States, is here in the valley. They are supposed to be here. They're not supposed to be in Australia, where they're wreaking havoc. They're not supposed to be in Florida, where they're, they're hurting the ecosystem there. But our, most of our native wildlife can take that bufo to uh, toxin. It may bother them a little bit, but they can make it through it, because they're supposed to be here. So. If you see a, a, a cane toad, it's supposed to be here. Don't kill it. They, they, uh, they actually eat, their, one of their favorite foods is cockroaches. So if you don't want cockroaches around, keep the toads. Okay? Oh, yeah. Um, that was the hook-nosed snake. Yeah, some background, not that you guys care about my journey, but it's... I've been looking for this darn snake for 13 years, and this is the one I finally found last year. And it was the last herp species I had to find down here, and it, it took me 13 years. No big deal. Yeah, thanks. Yeah. Uh, I did, but I put that one as private. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I don't blame people for doing that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what I'm talking about is, is, you know, a rare snake like this, people want to find it. There is a group of people out there that want to find it. And basically, if swarms of people come down here and try looking for this snake, they could mess up habitat. They could find them and then try to collect them. I don't think it would be with this snake, but um, they're just constantly harassing a certain population, and it could be bad for them. Uh, especially for a snake this rare. I put this one on iNaturalist as private, which means you absolutely can't see anything of when, where I found it, and that's to protect the species. Yeah. I think that mostly it's they're secretive. Like I said, they're burrowers, so they spend most of the time underground. I think they're more common than, than I think. I think I was just pretty darn unlucky, because I, I have people like sending me photos of them. Oh, I found this in my pool. And I'm like, I'm like, thanks. I'm like, you still have it? I want to come photograph it. Like, no, I let it go. I'm like, Ugh. So anyways, I finally got it. And uh, it may be the only one I ever see in my life. So who knows? Or actually, I'll probably start seeing them left and right now. I, I broke the curse. I'll probably get pl plenty of them. So yeah. Again, these guys eat uh, spiders and scorpions. So cool species. Yeah. All right. Show and tell time. Okay, cool. Thank you.
So I don't know if this will come up in the camera, but this. I think it's weird. I have a just a pillowcase here, but this is like the perfect thing to transport um, snakes in. Any guesses on what I got in here? What what kind of snake? Okay. You think it's an indigo? Yep. What's this snake? Huh? Yep, correct. Yeah. You know that because of the rhyme? I'm just kidding. Now, yeah, this is a Mexican mouse snake. So this is the one that mimics coral snakes, okay? They look a lot like them. Uh, main difference is, is the head shape. These guys have a pointed head. Coral snakes have a rounded head. Um, they usually, these guys have a... Um, Basically, the rings of coral snakes are kind of just more uniform all around their body. Sometimes they have a completely solid belly. Um, their rings just doesn't go all the way down like coral snakes. Anyways, not that you're going to remember that or know that if you see one. Just again, if you see a snake that has these colors, just don't bother it. Anyone want to hold this bad boy? Yeah. You want to pass it around? No, that's good. You're right. Yeah, so this is the indigo. Indigo snake for the ones at home. This is a small one, juvenile. They get like five times this size. What was that? What about it? No, the, the, it's just... The species, they don't generally change colors. They're not like, not like chameleons. Yeah, they could kind of lighten up, darken up, based on how warm they are, how much sun they're getting. But this is pretty general for Texas indigo snakes. Sure. But sometimes they can almost be jet black, this species. Yeah, yeah. I hope he doesn't smell that milk snake. So they actually eat other snakes, so probably doesn't smell it on my hands and bite me. If he does, it's no big deal. They're not, they're not dangerous. There we go. Do I want to touch it? Want to at least touch it? Yeah. Yeah? What if you're too far deep in... Yeah. Like if you get bit by a snake or yeah. basically uh, call for help, get your, lo your location. If you can maybe, you could punch in coordinates on Google Maps and then you could call 911 and they'll send out help, send out a chopper. That's about all you could do. But venomous snakes, you've got a lot of time. You're not going to die instantly from a snake bite. So keep that in mind. Hold it. Yeah. Oh, he has me now. Hold on, Nick. It's like no. They're pretty strong. Yeah. You know what kind of snake this is? Outside. Here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, like I said, this is a great habitat. Hey, uh, hey, I don't don't get the don't get those too close to it. Yeah, you can have a snack. Uh, so that's a a Mexican racer. Yep, yep, harmless lizard eaters, really fast snakes. Yeah. Yeah, that's a cool snake. That's one of the ones that people come down here and look for. So this is perfect habitat for them. Yeah. Was it here trying to come in through this? Uh, oh, yeah. Open the doors? Through the glass. Try to move it through 
Yeah, Mexican racer for sure. Yeah. Thank you. Harmless. You want to hold it? Yeah. I was holding it. He didn't care. Uh, milk snake. Milk snake. Yeah. Where they got that name was uh, ranchers used to say there's a myth that these snakes would come and basically bite and attach themselves to cow's udders. Okay, which is ridiculous because they do not drink milk. <laughs> I don't know what, what they saw to make them think that. really um, dark on the screen, so maybe I'll light it up a little bit. People could see. Mm -hmm. This is another snake that people travel far and wide to come see down here. This is the one I'm real worried about with um, collectors, because a lot of people want these for, for pets and breeding and, and the pet trade, so I keep all these locations secret and private. That I find that species. Um, well, they used to be. So, they're, so they're not on the threatened list anymore. But there are some. There are some guidelines with having them still in Texas. Um, you got to check the TPWD website, but I think it's a, I think you got to get an educational permit. Um, and that's it. It's pretty straightforward. It's a lot easier, a lot easier now than it was when they were on the, the threatened list. Yeah. He's a couple years old. Yeah. Snakes could live well over 20 years old too. So he's a young one. Yeah. Everything. But I'm mostly a snake guy, I must admit. My favorites are snakes, especially venomous snakes. Yeah. <laughs> and you're here to tell the story. What's that? And you're here to tell the story. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Just, just trying to educate. Uh, I luckily have not been bitten by a venomous snake. And hopefully I never will. Yeah. Yeah, especially at the zoo, we, we have very um, strict protocols with handling our venomous snakes. We never use our hands. We have tools. And uh, we, we stock all the proper anti-venom, which is the medicine you would take to the hospital if you were to be bitten, for each species we have, so. Yeah. Yeah, it's um, usually what we do is we peek before we put our hands there. Uh, you just saw the after effects, but yeah, and sometimes we even use hooks and tools to flip that stuff. Yeah. No, no this, as long as you watch where you put your hands, you're okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a hobby. I wore this for you today. Oh, yeah, awesome. <laughs> yep, photograph them, just like people go birding, and, and then they, they, they try to cross off their life list, you know, like they have species they want to see, just like I do, like that hook-nosed snake. That was like the last one I needed to find, and now I have. Um, so now I'm expanding north. Now I got to find all the ones in Texas. It's, it's gonna be rough. Yeah, there. Yeah, there's like almost a hundred species of snake in Texas. So. Oh, I can't tell you that. I found it. Uh, I'll just say I found it in Hidalgo County. How about that? I've never heard of such a thing. Uh, if you're talking about like cobras, I mean, cobras will stand up like that and hood up, and that's just a defensive posture. So I've never seen a snake or heard of a snake standing up erect. Uh, maybe what they're talking about also is uh, what's called periscoping. So a lot of snakes will just poke out of the grass and stand up their head like that, and that's to see better, like a periscope. 
They're trying to see their surroundings for predators or uh, possible prey items. What? Is there any particular time of day it's best to find snakes? Uh, morning. For daytime, it's morning or evening when it's not so hot. Um, sun's coming up. Snakes are out basking in the sun. And it may have been cold the night before, so they're trying to get warmed up. That's the best time. Which snakes cross the Rio Grande? All of them. Yeah. All snakes can swim. And... Uh, and th that body of water won't stop snakes. Snake found only in Caldwell, Cameron County. Term is only found in Tamaulipas as well. I, I guess part of the question was if we find them here, they'll probably be on the other side of the river. Oh yeah, all the species found in these the lower Rio Grande Valley can be can be found in, in northern Tamaulipas for sure. Yeah, we answered that one. Oh, okay. Call 911. Oh. Try to get a helicopter out. But like I said, that's you got a lot of time. You're not going to drop dead from a snake bite. It takes hours and hours and hours. And yeah, you got time to get to the hospital. Oh, okay. Yeah. But just don't drive yourself. No, because a lot of times it could cause shock. You're already panicked. <coughs> the venom can cause shock. And you pass out, oh. which is far more dangerous than the snake bite. Yeah. Go back in there. Go back in your pillowcase. Back in your pillowcase. Snakes like, feel, they, they feel secure in these things. And that it's breathable and it's dark. And then he'll go back, back to the zoo tomorrow. Yeah, I mean, I could take it back, but it's too late. Everything's closed down. Totally fine, totally comfortable. It's just brief and it'll be back in its, its enclosure tomorrow. Nope. Nope. The only thing is I have uh, one time I, I had this in the field and it got a hole in it. And I put a snake in there, I didn't realize it. I get to the car and it's gone. <laughs> yeah, I was just going to get my camera take photos. I'm like, oh, whatever. So it, now I make sure to check the bag. Yeah. Yeah. No.
minutes. I'm going to take a picture. Oh, okay. Those are the ones that you want. It's going away now. Good night, buddy. I am so surprised that they eat rattlesnakes and. Actually, grab rattlesnake. Yeah. So you crush them, right? That's how they kill them. Oh. Yep. And if they're bitten by a rattlesnake, they can take it. Immune. Really? Yep. Okay. Yep. Does not does not bother them. Indigo. Indigo. Yeah. Yeah. I should I should mention that. Yeah. Indigo indigo snakes are actually immune to rattlesnake venom. So that's how they can eat them. There's no danger to them. So, yeah. They're like the ultimate snake down here. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So you have the same reviews? Yep, they do too. And milk snakes. Yeah. Yeah, I forgot about the king snakes. King snakes, yeah, they can eat rattlesnakes, no problem. Well, I don't have any research at all. I mean, they have health not just not just all right, folks, for everyone online, have a good night. Thank you for joining class tonight.